Thanks a lot, Peter. Uh, before I get started, I obviously want to uh, give a huge thanks to Lasse, Eva, and Kristen for all their great work. Uh, I am uh, very sorry that due to the COVID that we can't be there uh, right now to uh, have this PhD course as well as the symposium, but hopefully next year things will be a bit easier. Uh, just to clarify a bit, I'm a sociologist of science and technology, and I've had a very long term interest in biobanking, and I've been following biobanking really for about uh, 20 years or so. Uh, today I'm going to discuss possible future directions of ethical, legal, social implications or, or debate uh, with regard to biobanks, registries, and health data. So if this hasn't been sort of driven into your skulls quite yet, then let me try once again to do this. Uh, obviously, the Nordic countries have very unique resources when it comes to biomedical research. Uh, we have a lot of registers and biobanks uh, that serve as an excellent research infrastructure for innovative research on health as well as welfare. We also have very similar systems in terms of the personal identification number and Eva highlighted very nicely how this actually is very different in many countries where you might have several different numbers depending on who you're uh, dealing with. Whereas in the Nordic countries, as you know, it's the one number that sort of follows you from uh, your clinic visit to the library to wherever you may be going. In addition to that, we have these long population-based time series, which a number of the presentations uh, today and yesterday have touched upon uh, really nicely and highlighted how, how useful they are in studying uh, uh, disease. And obviously, once more, we are known as the Nordic gold mine. And in addition, we also have a number or have had during the past uh, 10, 15 years, a number of sort of uh, policies and uh, 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 political sort of uh, attempts to integrate and develop interoperability between sort of biobanks and registries. And on the right here, you have uh, one example of a policy paper by Nordforsk. So as we've also discussed, uh, the collection of tissue is not a new phenomenon, but rather that's been going on for a very, very long time, particularly in hospitals with tissue collections, pathology collections, and so forth. But the LC discussion surrounding particularly biobanking is relatively new. Obviously within medical research, we've had the World Medical Association's Declaration of Helsinki since 1964. Uh, but since about uh, 2000, these things have been uh, sort of revamped and rethought, particularly in relation to biobanking. So particularly during the past 20 years, we've had quite vibrant discussion regarding the ethical, legal, and social concerns surrounding biobanking. And I would argue that one of the reasons that this has taken place has to do with Iceland and the case of deco genetics. Uh, in 1998. And after that, particularly in Anglo-American, Anglo-European sort of context, we have a lot of debate uh, regarding biobanking. Later on, then we have discussions within Asia, within Africa and Latin America, which sort of follows this uh, trend. And what we see within this context is a sort of uh, gradual national implementation and interpretation of ethical guidelines and directives. So this includes soft law, if, if you will. Now, even though we sort of highlight the similarities between the Nordic countries, there are also very big differences between how the Nordic countries implement and interpret certain cases. So there's a broad range of different implementations within the Nordic countries. However, within this context, there's a sort of there's been a sort of stabilization uh, of these debates and. Uh, Biobankers are perhaps uh, maybe a bit sick of these discussions as well. If you raise, start talking about LC in front of a biobanker, you might just catch a glimpse of them rolling their eyes and saying, okay, here we go again. So a lot of this has sort of started going around in a, in a circle. So 
Today, I'd like to sort of try and touch upon the emergence of new types of concerns and discussions. So new perspective and maybe sort of bigger issues, which I think surround uh, this research field in terms of managing samples, biobanks, as well as health data in general. So like I said, during the past decade or so, there's been a changing context of biobank research. And I just pulled a quote from a uh, sort of report uh, on joint Nordic registers and biobanks, which came out, I think this is 2014, and this was also supported by Nordforsk. And in that they say, uh, there should be in the Nordic countries support uh, for the development of technical solutions enabling secure transfer, storage, and access to research data across borders, possibly through the Nordic e-infrastructure collaboration. They go on to say, uh, investigate the possibility of creating a unified data sharing facility in each country, such as the Danish solution for health data. So this is really just an example of the direction uh, that I think biobanking and register-based research uh, infrastructure development is going towards. So, uh, and a lot of the speakers today uh, and yesterday have sort of highlighted this. Tina and Lasse have also shown how, you know, different resources can be brought together. And I've sort of made bold, bolded the a number of words about transfer, access, movement across borders, and sharing to sort of think about, you know, how, how this thinking is starting to change. So instead of, you know, there being all these different silos that trying to facilitate easier access. And I think this is really key in terms of trying to think about the possible future uh, ethical uh, questions and debates that we are already facing, but will be facing in the future as well. And one of these ideas is this notion of a one-stop shop. So as we know, uh, and I'm sure many of you who have uh, uh, experience in doing research, collecting data, collecting samples, bringing data together from different resources, uh, research is hampered by fragmentation of data as well as sample sources. Particularly if you think about rare diseases and so forth, then it might be very difficult to find uh, the appropriate amount of samples you need. And this is also reflected by the fact that there's a lot of administrative fragmentation. So you might have multiple permit authorities, ethical review boards, uh, data protection uh, authorities, biobank approval, uh, particularly if you're looking for different types of data, socioeconomic data, prescriptions and so forth, then you'll be actually dealing with a lot of different authorities. And this can be very time consuming, very frustrating. And it in a way is a, is a block or, or hindrance to uh, conducting research in a timely manner, particularly in certain situations like now with COVID, you know, there is a pressing need to sort of get things done. And so there is this move towards or a thinking towards a one-stop shop. And Lasse also gave a very nice example of how uh, the Danish National Biobank is sort of trying to facilitate this in terms of there being a catalog and then you can find what you need and go from there. And this sort of reflects this idea of developing digital gateways. And so within this context, there's a move from sharing data and some of the talks yesterday, I think we're touching upon this. So instead of be data being sent from one place to another, then you actually just get access to it. So through cloud-based services and so forth. So, Within this context, uh, I'd like to discuss Finland as a case example of how this is playing out uh, within a national context. Uh, in some of the talks, uh, we've touched upon uh, the Finnish uh, infrastructure and legal framework on how it is being developed to facilitate this. Uh, the first major change, I think, was in 2013 with the Finnish Biobank Act. And now uh, we have this uh, gateway called Fingenius, which provides access to all the national or, or uh, various biobanks uh, in Finland, uh, which are maintained by independent biobanks, such as the National Public Health Institute, but also hospital regions, as well as uh, private biobanks, the blood service and, and so forth. So it's a similar to the National Danish Biobank sort of catalog. This is uh, our sort of gateway. 
in addition to that, uh, Mark Daly was talking about the FinGen uh, project, which uh, started up in 2017, which is a major sort of public-private partnership to try and uh, utilize all these resources uh, for research and development. But most recently, we've had the act on the secondary use of health and social data, which was enacted last year. And as, as a result of that, uh, there was a setting up of the FinData Permit Authority, which started at the beginning of this year. So it's only been active for 11 months. And what FinData does is it promotes the secondary use of health and social data. It facilitates data permit processing and improves data protection for individuals. Now, I was trying to think how I could show what they do, but I would recommend that if you have a chance, you should go to their website at findata.fi and click on English if you want, or if you read Swedish, you can also look it up in Swedish. So what they do is if you have to get data from multiple sources, then instead of going to those two sources, then you can just go through them and then they'll handle the rest of that. So the idea is that you only deal with one authority. And this sort of goes back to the idea of the one one stop shop. And uh, similarly to what Naomi Allen was talking about with UK Biobank, the idea is also that there is a level playing field for all actors. So both public and private actors can access uh, access this data. And since it's just being setting, uh, set up, uh, the number of sort of public authorities who have signed up for this is still in development phase, but I, I uh, suggest that you go and see it because I think it sort of gives you the idea of what the thinking is in Finland in terms of, well, how should this work? So instead of a researcher having to go to multiple agencies and authorities, they can just go to one and they'll manage the rest, making life uh, hopefully a lot easier for research and also making it a lot quicker to get the permits uh, to do that. Now, this takes us to the idea of data lakes as a solution. And so I, as I was talking about these gateways, there is a move away from this idea of data within silos and compartments to a more unified analysis uh, environment. And there are different names for this, uh, data lakes, sandboxes, clouds, and so forth. And this change is not just happening in terms of biobanking and registers. It's happening across all sort of lever, uh, levels of uh, national government, but also regional and local. So hospital regions are trying to do this. And on the left bottom hand corner, you have a image of the Helsinki uh, region hospital region and its idea of uh, developing a data lake for all its data. Uh, then there's also a idea for uh, uh, Aurora AI is to develop a similar system to facilitate the development of AI in Finland using all these resources. But uh, it's also happening in cities, uh, government agencies and so forth. So this idea that you don't have to go to all these different places to access the information, but you would have one gateway. So really, I think change in the way we're thinking about uh, implementing data infrastructures, if you will. And in a sense, this sort of follows on for this idea as uh, national resources as a, a type of test bed or a platform for research and development and the development of national data ecosystems. And this is something that Finland is sort of quite keen on developing to compete with its neighboring countries, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, uh, and Iceland. But obviously this is not just a technical project, but also requires public acceptance and trust in what is being done. And this is not always quite clear. Uh, one of the problems with this is systemic changes like this are quite difficult to cover through informed consent. Obviously, if you're involved with patients themselves and you're doing research, that's one thing. But once that data is collected and it goes into databases and it sort of enters this larger national data ecosystem, it's kind of hard to describe that in, you know, one page informed consent system. So. This brings me to my next slide and some of the new ELSI concerns, which I think are emerging through these or with regard to these changes. 
So what I'd like to talk about is uh, the Vastamo data breach. Now, Vastamo is a private Finnish psychotherapy service provider. And uh, towards the end of September, so uh, month or a month and a half ago, it became apparent that they had a data breach, which actually happened two years ago, but it was not reported to the police until the September of 2020. Uh, what happened in this data breach was that the electronic patient records of therapy sessions were stolen or hacked. Uh, the hacker uh, demanded then, or they waited a little while uh, to make their demands to the company, but then they demanded 450,000 euros in bitcoins from the company, which then the bitcoin did not pay because the police didn't want them to pay. After which, or subsequently, uh, the hackers then sent emails to all of the people whose files they had demanding 200 euros in Bitcoin within 24 hours. And if they didn't comply for, to that, then 400 euros in Bitcoin within 48 hours. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, the patient records have very sensitive information regarding people's therapy sessions. And the records went on for about 10 years. So there's everything from people discussing uh, depression, suicide, uh, rape, sexual assault. There are reports or, or patient records from minors. Uh, so quite, quite a bit of data was stolen. And as a result, uh, a lot of those re records or a large chunk of that uh, uh, patient record database was actually uh, posted on Tor. And as of last Monday, 25,000 individuals have reported offenses to the police. So obviously hacking is not a new phenomenon but we seem to be very poorly prepared for the consequences of it from a national perspective. Now, I wanna make very, very clear at this point that my point in raising this case, which has just recently happened in Finland, uh, is not to argue that biobanks and registers are not well uh, protected and secure within the Nordic countries. Quite the contrary, during the past 10, 15 years that I've been following biobankers uh, within the Nordic countries, uh, I've learned a whole lot about how well they are protected and the measures that are taken to make sure that people's information is quite uh, safe. Uh, the Vastamo case is also quite different in the sense that uh, the records are in a readable format. So they're sort of reports written by people, whereas genetic data is quite hard to understand, even if you're doing a PhD or, or a professor of, uh, uh, of genetics. Uh, but what is important, I think, in this case is how it highlights the types of vulnerabilities uh, that the state and society has in general uh, with regard to data management as well as digital disasters. And so what I'd like to suggest is that what this represents is a sort of new type of catastrophe, right? And a catastrophe is an event causing great and unusual sudden damage or suffering, also known as a disaster. And we're used to natural disasters, right? Earthquakes, fires, flooding. And we have a lot of systems in place that help respond and ameliorate some of the consequences of natural disasters. However, uh, we seem to be very poorly prepared to uh, respond and manage digital disasters. And when we're talking about a case like the Vastamo case, where there are 25,000 people whose very, very personal and sensitive information is out there on the internet, uh, it seems all the more important to talk about uh, this issue uh, within the Nordic countries. So why is this important? Well, obviously, the things that I discussed about first within the Nordic countries reflect systemic changes, so legislation, infrastructure. And these are very difficult to cover and discuss in informed consent for a particular research, or even if you're sort of donating a sample and information for a biobank. Other important point is these can be very large scale. So they involve many ind individuals. So there's very broad societal impact. 
Uh, we need, really need to ask what types of contingency plans we need to protect individuals in these cases. Uh, we've also seen that breach in one area will have a lot of consequences in other systems. Uh, a lot of these people are also very concerned about identity theft because the social security numbers are now available. Uh, and technically, at least in Finland, it's relatively easy to get a small loan from some of these small loan companies, or you could buy uh, something from Amazon and then bill it to another person. And so this is something that has been discussed a lot right now. And actually, just yesterday, Yesterday, the government met to discuss uh, how to facilitate the, uh, the possibility to change your social security number in Finland in an easier way with regard to what has just uh, happened. And so obviously the issues related to system integration and interoperability have a lot of ethical, legal and social uh, dimensions. And main question also is how do you maintain trust in situations of crisis? So how are you able to convince people to continue to go to therapy, for instance, in this type of situation? And it's really critical that we're able to sort of uh, reassure people that the systems are safe, even though some of them have uh, failed to protect them. So and this brings me to the idea of national preparedness. Uh, so Finland has this national emergency supply agency called NESA, and the job of NESA is to maintain security of supply stockpiles. Now, uh, NESA has, was formed after World War II, and they have a lot of stockpiles of various types of supplies, which we think are needed in case of crisis. And particularly we were thinking about a war. So our neighbors to the east would attack and we were thinking, well, what do we need in case of those? And for the first time since World War II, uh, uh, the stockpiles were opened during the COVID crisis because we were running out of face masks. So they opened them up, but it also showed that the sort of uh, emergency and crisis mentality and planning was focused on a military conflict. So nothing like COVID and certainly nothing like uh, this sort of a data, data breach. They do, however, provide uh, services for backing up data, but not really to manage data breaches. And this sort of raises the issue of uh, we really need to better understand vulnerability and the consequences of data breaches. So what does vulnerability mean in the digital age? And if you think about uh, these files uh, which have been leaked, uh, they really have an endless life, right? So uh, something like if you've been there to discuss marital problems, then that file is now out there and you don't know how or when it might pop up again. Multiple people have access to it and someone may try to blackmail you in the future with it. And so there's this constant sort of uncertainty which is over a lot of people's heads. And we don't really have a very good solution to how we manage this. So just to sum up and finally discuss some of uh, the possible LC discussions and debates related to biobanking and registers. Obviously, there are trade-offs. Uh, I think, and I myself would be a big promoter, proponent of developing systems that accelerate research and development. And particularly, uh, COVID is one of those examples where we definitely need to have access to a lot of information and quite quickly. At the same time, there is a trade-off in how uh, we are able to control data and who has access to it and how it might accidentally leak outside. And so how do we facilitate debate and discussions on these top topics. Obviously, uh, informed consent is not very good for this, but we need some sort of uh, mechanism, social mechanism through which we discuss this. Furthermore, how do we prepare for data ecosystems from a legislative perspective? As I also already uh, noted, uh, it is possible to change your social security number or PIN uh, in Finland. However, it's quite laborious. And right now they're thinking about, well, how can we make this quicker in case uh, we have a situation like this coming up again? And what kind of other protections do we put in place uh, regarding identity and these sort of uh, breaches? And how does the state prepare to protect individuals? 
So what kind of systemic preparedness should we have uh, in relation to this? And how do we protect vulnerable populations? Uh, now, obviously, uh, this discussion is not limited to biobanks and registers, but is much broader. But I think the experiences and the know-how that biobankers and register maintainers have is crucial in facilitating uh, this discussion. And hopefully, it's also something that we will continue to discuss in the future in developing safer systems, uh, which also facilitate research and development. Thanks.